Well, as a parent, um, the signs of depression, the things that kind of jump out to you should be those things that are uh, behavioral as well as emotional. So we're thinking about crankiness or anger, um, continuously feeling sad or hopeless, being socially withdrawn, uh, being sensitive to rejection, changes in the child's appetite, either you know you have an increase or a decrease in appetite. There could be changes in sleep, whether the person or the child is uh, sleepy excessively or not sleeping enough, having some sort of vocal outburst, crying, things of that nature, uh, difficulties with concentration, fatigue and low energy, um, some physical complaints like headaches and stomach aches, um, those kinds of things, and then trouble during events where they just can't seem to engage either with family or with uh, children at school or in their hobbies. And then some feelings of worthlessness, uh, feelings of guilt, um, difficulties with concentration. And then in some rare instances, there could be uh, difficulties with uh, suicidal ideation. And so one thing that we want to make sure we keep uh, at the forefront is that depression is uh, up to about 3% of children do suffer from depression. And in adolescence, it's about 8% in the U.S. And that that condition is significantly more common in boys under the age of 10. But then it kind of flips a little bit when you get to about 16, then it becomes more more prevalent in, in girls. That's actually a really good question because when we're thinking about being stressed and depressed, um, a really safe space is very, very important in order for any person, not just children, to kind of feel comfortable talking about those things that really impact them. So teaching your child how to identify their emotions is really important because when you're having this safe space, you want to ensure that they know how to identify what's going on on the inside. Um, and you can do this through a number of ways, depending on the age of your child. You can do role plays, um, you can do games, and any other activity that allows you to kind of go through the full spectrum of the emotions. And you can Google pulling up an emotion sheet and it can show faces of the different types of emotions if the child is younger. And you can kind of do a flashcard kind of situation and allow the child to kind of identify what the emotion is that they're having. Now, in regards to creating this kind of safe space, um, what you want to do is you can uh, create the routine in your house where you have a specific space for your children to have these important conversations, um, a space that can be designated theirs. Um, and if you have multiple children, they all can use the same space, but you know, taking turns and things of that nature. Um, and then being able to uh, just support them and shower them with positive affirmations and self-esteem building, um, helping them use positive self-talk and those kinds of things will help a child feel comfortable talking about uh, depression and, and stress that is impacting them. This is a very difficult question um, when we're thinking about trying to help uh, kids stay calm during a pandemic. It's the same question for adults as well. We're trying to keep them calm during this pandemic. Um, the three R's are really what I kind of focus on with, with parents and children, and it is um, regulate, relate, and reason. And so generally, it's just kind of really trying to help the child stay grounded. And so trying to stay in the moment. So if there is an event that occurs and you see an emotional outburst or behavioral outburst, trying to bring the child back to the, the present as opposed to allowing them to, you know, to escape or avoid it is one way of keeping their focus in the here and now, getting down on their level. So one of the things that uh, most parents do when trying to help children is we stay standing. Um, but one way of really getting into uh, connecting with them, creating a safe space so it's not this huge power dynamic, I'm the parent and you're the child, is getting down maybe on all fours or on your knees and talking to the child at their level, um, trying to help reduce that level of threat. Because when we're all stressed, we, we function from our primitive brain, so to speak, for the lack of a better term um, and that allows us to stay safe so we we fight or we flight at that point in time and so getting down to that level allows you to really uh, reduce that threat um, regulate in their focus and trying to help soothe them um, since we're focusing from or coming from this primitive portions of our brains when we're trying to um, 
stay safe, it is easy to, to try and use some sort of um, relaxation technique, either deep breathing, um, counting or identifying things in the environment will help the child kind of calm down just enough so you can actually talk to them. And then it's in that relate period where you can actually talk about the emotions um, and validate the feelings that they're having in the moment. And so once you kind of go through that cycle, you will see that the child is able to kind of go through this normal course of, of responding to their environment. Because one thing we don't want them to uh, take away from our conversation is that the way you're feeling is an Accurate. And so we want them to know that the way I feel is my body's way of communicating to me how the environment is impacting me. It might be slightly dysregulated, meaning I might overshoot what the response should be, but the feeling in itself is, is a true feeling that we should be having. And then you can talk to them and reason through what it is. So if it is an overarching kind of um, response, then you can actually kind of bring them back down and, and help them see alternative ways of looking at what might have happened to cause them to feel the way that they feel.